government funding for Asian American owned businesses decreased drastically, while restrictions and fees increased. From 2004 to 2007, Chicago City Council excluded Asian Americans from its construction MBE, otherwise known as Minority Business Enterprise Program, despite the discrimination Asian American contractors face on a daily basis. First of all, on a very difficult night as we uh, respond to the blizzard of last week, I know a lot of you have had to you know, dig out your parking spots and find a new parking spot tonight. Please give yourselves a round of applause for making democracy work in Chicago and coming out on a tough Tuesday night. Thank you, I know the candidates are all grateful for that as well. And as people come in, I encourage you, there we go, I encourage you to come right to the front. There are still some uh, seats available at the front, and we always know the best students always sat near the front of the hall, so come on up. Uh, I have had, uh, I am uh, very grateful for the honor and this privilege to welcome you to the first Pan-Asian Voter Empowerment Mayoral Candidates Forum. Uh, this is the first ever Pan-Asian Mayoral Candidates Forum here in the city of Chicago. And again, we are very excited to, to see such a big and robust crowd. And if each of you gets two other people to vote, and those people get two other people to vote, we are going to really have the voice of the people being heard two weeks from tonight. We are uh, very proud to be joined on the stage tonight by several candidates for mayor in the city of Chicago. One of the individuals on this stage perhaps is going to be the leader of this grand city and we should be very thankful for those who have come here tonight. I've had the, good on I've had the great honor to interview each one of these folks and some of their colleagues and I know deep in their heart they all care deeply about the people, they care deeply about the city, they care deeply about democracy. So whatever choice we make is probably going to be a good one. So let's make a great choice. So how about a round of applause for our candidates tonight, Gary Chico former head of the Chicago Public Schools, Miguel Del Valle, our city clerk in Chicago, and Patricia Van Pelt Watkins. Now the format of this forum is going to be very straightforward, but it's going to be a little bit different than maybe a lot of the things the candidates have seen before and certainly what you've seen. But we're going to do something based on the notion of testimony tonight. Each candidate, first of all, is going to be given two minutes, two minutes to have an opening statement. And following that, a member of our community from the various subgroups is going, who has been pre-selected is going to be offering testimony and a question that each of the candidates is then going to be able to respond to. So there will be one question that comes after a testimony. Each of the candidates will get a chance to respond to that. Then, uh, that response will only be 90 seconds. So we're going to try to keep this more or less to time. And first of all, just to show you candidates how well organized we are and how this is a whole new era for Asian Americans, we started this event on time. We started this event on time and I'm very happy and I'm sure you're all very happy about that. So the timekeeper down here, where's the timekeeper? Do I see the time? There's the timekeeper right there. Is going to be um, holding up signs saying that you have 45 seconds left and then 20 seconds and then finally giving me the high sign to give you the high sign to stop talking. But I'm sure everyone will respect those rules accordingly. After that, I'm going to get a chance to uh, follow up with at least one or maybe two questions based on the concept that is uh, being discussed at that time. And again, I will invite you at that point, candidates, to feel free to jump in on each other, in, not in a rude way, but if you have a point that you want to make in counterpoint to something that you've heard, please let me know or please jump in. And if it gets too rowdy, I'll settle it down, but I'm sure, I'm sure you guys will do it in a, in a spirit of civility uh, that we have here tonight. Now, the candidates are going to be asked to, in their responses, again, be 90 seconds on the first one and then about a minute for the second one. And then at the end of our question and answer period tonight, each candidate will have the opportunity to make a closing statement of no more than a minute long. So, with that said, our community uh, representatives are here beside me right now, and we're going to get started, uh, before you guys get started, with your one minute, oh, one and a half minute, I should say, opening statement. And first, we'll start with Patricia Van Pelt Watkins. Patricia? Hello everyone, happy Chinese New Year. <laughs> All right, I'm Dr. Patricia Van Pelt Watkins, and many of you know me from the times when I've marched with you in the streets for immigration reform, how I stood with you during the Minutemen, when the Minutemen came to Arlington Heights, I stood with you in that march, spoke out against the atrocities that were, being, were happening along the border. Um, also had people to go down to, um, go down to um, 
Phoenix, Arizona, to help people register to vote and unite people around a common theme, and that is justice not for one, but justice for all. So I grew up in the Cabrini Green projects. My mom was a civil rights activist. My dad was a cab driver. My dad was in a terrible car accident, and it caused us to live in poverty for many years. My mom struggled to bring uh, food in the house, but she taught me something during that time. She said, justice is not coming. You have to fight for it. And that's why I'm so proud of the Pan-Asian community right now, because you have decided that you will not take what's been given to you in the past, but you are beginning to demand ac access, demand representation, and demand your fair share of resources. And that's what it's going to take. Because if we're not willing to organize ourselves and speak up for ourselves, America proves us that you won't get rights or uh, access. But if you unite yourselves as you have done, and I am very proud of you, because this is what it takes in America to make ourselves strong. So God bless you, and I'm looking forward to working with you. Patricia Van Pelt Watkins, thank you very much. Miguel Del Valle, everyone. Thank you very much, and it's an honor to be here this evening, and I want to thank all of you for participating in an important process, the process of determining who the next mayor of the city of Chicago will be. I have a very long, long history of working with different ethnic communities throughout the entire city of Chicago. My history with issues like immigration reform started back in the 1980s. And prior to that, when I was executive director of Association House, a multi-human services agency where I had adult education classes, English as a second language class, and other services for the immigrant population. And then as a legislator, as a state senator for 20 years, I sponsored many bills to protect the rights of immigrants at the state level. And I helped create the New Americans Initiative at the state level. And then as city clerk of the city of Chicago, I've made sure that we are respecting our immigrants as they come into the city government for services. And so my role has been primarily one of an advocate and the area I've worked the most on is political empowerment through the redistricting process. And now I can say that this time around, I think the Asian community is going to be in a wonderful position to make sure that as the maps of the districts, political districts are drawn, that the Asian community will have a strong voice in that process and have greater influence in determining the political leadership of this city. And I want to see Asian... Miguel Del Valle, everyone, thank you very much. Next is uh, Gary Chico, and uh, Mr. Chico, if, before you start, I just want to introduce to the crowd, uh, former Senator Carol Mosley Braun has joined us. Thank you for coming. You'll have a chance to speak in just a moment. You haven't missed a thing. Thank you so much. Everyone, Gary Chico, former head of the Chicago Public Schools. Thank you, everyone, and good evening. Thank you to the Ameri Asian American Institute for hosting this event, Ravi Bejfal, for taking his day off to come moderate this, this wonderful debate. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, I grew up on the southwest side of Chicago. I am the grandson of an immigrant who came from Mexico to this country with nothing, looking for a better life. And like you, I've had to work for everything I've gotten. First, I worked in my father's gas station, and I made it to the mayor's office as his chief of staff. I went to night law school because I had to work during the day, and I became the president of the Chicago Board of Education. Ladies and gentlemen, the city of Chicago must must work also to live within its means and get our budget in order so that we can continue to provide services to communities like yours throughout this city. Right now we are not doing that. And I am experienced in having put together 16 budgets, all balanced and with surpluses, that will leave us in good financial shape. There is one of the candidates who is not here, Ravi, who chooses to take a very different path. That person would tax us and our services and I'm not going to let that happen. I very much ask for your support and look forward to working with your community. I am very proud of my record of working with the Asian American community in this city, having recommended the first deputy chief of staff of the city of Chicago who was Asian. And it was my pleasure to do that. Sarah Pang was her name. And also recommending to Mayor Daley the first deputy mayor for international affairs, Mr. Paul Park. And it's a pleasure to be with you each and every one
Gary Chico, everyone. Thank you very much, Mr. Chico. And just joining us perfectly in time, another person who I know cares deeply about the city of Chicago, someone I've also had a chance to interview, which is what I said about all the other candidates as well. Uh, please welcome Carol Mosley Braun for your one and a half minute opening statement. Uh, well, wait, wait, let's see. Okay. Don't have to start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ravi, and to uh, Mr. Thet Lee and to the Pan Asian Conference. Thank you so much for organizing this forum and giving us a chance to present our credentials and present ourselves to you. My name is Carol Mosley Braun, and I'm a candidate for mayor because I have, I love this city, I'm a product of Chicago, and I care about the future of this city and the direction that we take as one community. I believe that we have to have balanced growth that focuses in on giving people decent schools in the neighborhoods, job creation in the neighborhoods, public safety in the neighborhoods, and a quality of life in the neighborhoods that responds to and makes this the most pleasant city in the United States in which to live. I think the best way to tell what someone's going to do is based on what they have done. I have been a pioneer all of my life. Coming out of the Chicago Public Schools, I went to law school at the University of Chicago, and then I went to the state legislature where I legislated in regards to a number of issues, printing or having passing laws that allowed for the first bilingual support in the state of Illinois. Then from there, I went and became recorder of deeds of Cook County and opened up that office and began to include uh, people of Asian and other ethnicities in that office, which had been previously closed to us. Um, I then went on to the state, to the state legislature, um, of, to the United States Senate, I mean, and as the United States Senator, worked with many people here even uh, in regards to immigration issues to help open up. I believe the government should include all. All right, all right Carol Mosley Braun, thank you. And you have some four great candidates here. Thank you very much for one and a half minutes in your opening statements. Now we are going to get to our issue of testimony, where what we'll do is speak, one person who has been pre-selected from a, a variety of communities will be giving a, a little bit of a talk, not too long, and then it will end up in a question. In that response to that question, you'll each have a minute to respond to that question, and I'll divvy up the order of how we uh, respond to that. But uh, after that, there will be a follow-up of about a minute, minute and a half, with one or two questions. So I think we've got about six or seven segments or testimonies to go through. We plan to get out of here by eight o'clock tonight, but certainly with democracy better fed. So without further ado, let's start with our first testimony. Please welcome Francis Candelario from the Alliance of Filipinos for Immigrant Rights and Empowerment. Francis. Good evening, candidates. My name is Francisco Candelario. I am a senior citizen and a resident of Albany Park, and I am a member of Our Lady of Mercy Ferris. After coming to America from the Philippines almost 20 years ago, my family and I have lived in Albany Park community. With my two grown children, one lived in Bolingbrook, and one in California, my wife and I live alone. We have become very concerned that as an elderly couple and as immigrants, we are now target of crime. It seems as if the neighborhood has become much less safe. While it has been widely reported that crime rates have decreased in Chicago from 2009 to 2010. Seniors and new immigrants continue to be targeted for crimes at a higher rate than other population. So this is my question for you candidates. Under your administration, how will the Chicago Police Department be better equipped to serve and protect Asian Americans with language and cultural competency. Thank you and good night. Francis, thank you very much. Our first answer, Patricia Van Pelt Watkins. Thank you. One minute. <laughs> so first of all, I think that the, the police should follow the crime. We should not have areas that are not being protected. 
And I think that the city government and the workers should reflect the population. So when you talk about language competency, um, then we need to be sure that we have people who speak the language that needs, that's spoken in this area within your community as uh, standing in the offices of uh, police and, other, and also providing other services. I, I think one of the problems we've had in this city is that we tend to think that every neighborhood should get X amount of police officers and not understanding that some areas are suffering even more crime than other areas and we don't talk about that. So I think we need to talk about where the crime is and the police should follow the crime. And we should also have people that reflect our own race and our ethnicity leading the way in our own communities when it comes to public safety. Thank you. Mr. Del Valle. Well, it is important to have police officers who speak the languages, but it's also important to have an organized community. What you described calls out for an organized community. An organized community is a strong community. You should not be alone. There should be neighbors who should be watching out for you also, working in partnership with the community policing program. The CAPS program needs to be totally redesigned so that there is direct contact on an ongoing basis with seniors in the community. We need community-based organizations working in community policing on a day-to-day -day basis. And as mayor, I am going to support the community organizing that is necessary so that you can empower yourselves to protect yourselves within the community and not be fearful after you have contributed so much. We should respect our elderly and we should protect our elderly population and we are all responsible for your well-being. Carol Mosley Braun. Uh, Gary, the, 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 organ, the, uh, the questions have been pre-selected. Oh, no Carol problem. Mosley Braun. <laughs> um, as I started to say in my opening statement, city government should include all and exclude none. That means that we need to hire Members, uh, <clears throat> members from the Pan Asian community, as members of the part of the of the police department, as police, and in all the different uh, job positions in the police department, we also have to focus in on community policing, making certain that law enforcement is not just a top down and occupying force, but rather the community has a relationship with the police. I would like to see a re restoration of the beat police, the police who work in the neighborhood, who know the neighbors, the neighbors know them. They can provide the relationship that will, in the end, better protect seniors and others in our community. As senator, I supported community policing. I supported the Violence Against Women Act. I've come from a law enforcement family. Everyone in my family has been in law enforcement, so we're very close to these issues and recognize that without public safety, we don't have the ability to create jobs or to do anything. Our seniors are at risk and held hostage. Thank you. Gary Chico. Thank you, Francis, for your question. One of the reasons the Fraternal Order of Police has endorsed me is because I agree that we're, we're short about 2,000 police officers in our police force, and I've committed to put those officers back on the police force and into our communities, not in centralized units, but in neighborhood districts, where a commander will have responsibility for making sure that people like Francis and many of the others in the room are protected. I also told the officers not too long ago in Chinatown that I would make sure that our force reflects the communities that we serve, not only at the patrolman rank, but at the, com at the commander rank and at the executive staff rank. By putting those 2,000 police officers into the police force, we will be able to bring back community policing, a program which I helped start with about seven other people in 1992. That is the way that we are going to make our community truly safe. Francis, are you satisfied with these answers? Seems to be quite satisfied. Here's where we do a little bit of a follow-up. Uh, I get to ask a follow-up question based on the same idea. Let me just start with Gary Chico. Where do you stand, Mr. Chico, on the current plan to redeploy certain police officers or certain groups or squadrons to other more high-crime districts in the city, mm -hmm. given that we have a limited budget right. and people who are in some of these places where they're going to lose police officers are not liking this plan very much? Well, I don't think redeployment is the answer. It's not the long-term answer. We are short 2,000 officers from our historic strength in the police department. We cannot keep moving people around at will because we see a pattern here, a pattern there. Because once you take the officer out, Robbie, from the district that they're in, you leave a hole. What if it's Francis's district? 
and now he doesn't see the walking officer. He doesn't see the car coming by, or even worse, his response time, if he places a call, can be an hour or two hours. That's why ultimately the solution is to have the total number of police that you need to properly protect our people. Fair enough. That's a bit of a long-term answer, but in the short term, we have a budget crunch around that. Mr. Del Valle, would you like to respond to that as well? First, first of all, I think that as we fill vacancies, and we will have to fill some of those vacancies, those officers can then be assigned. New officers coming online can then be assigned to areas that are in greater need. But I want to add that I think police officers should all live in the city of Chicago. They should not be allowed to move out to the suburbs because we need people in our neighborhoods living who are police officers who experience the same thing that you experience. If you have a police officer living on your block, I think he's gonna be a lot more sensitive to your plight than an officer who's living out in the suburbs but is collecting his paycheck from the taxes we pay in the city of Chicago. I offered the opportunity to the other uh, candidates. I said earlier, I'm not sure if you, you, you knew this, uh, Ms. Mosley Braun, that you can jump in at some point here as well. And we are supposed to only ask two follow-up questions, but obviously this is about crime, this is about public safety. Let's all get, let's get an answer from each one of you on that very quickly. Go ahead. Yes, I think that, um, I think that uh, Miguel is exactly right, that police officers should live in the city. I think also that it's not so much a matter of redeploying and, sh and, and moving people around, but rather we need to take some of the people who are right now at desk jobs in the, in, in the police department, clean out some of the, simplify some of the administration, and put those sworn officers who are trained in law enforcement back on the streets in these communities. We can always have people who are administrators and, and, and people who are, are, are clerks to work the paperwork, but we need to have the sworn officers back on the street, and that will give us, I think, the ability to provide adequate protection as we address the long-term issues of hiring. All right, Patricia Van Pelt Watkins, back to my original question, though. The question was, there is going to be, presumably, a redeployment of a lot of officers from lower crime districts to higher crime districts. You grew up in a high crime district. Presumably, some of the folks that you might represent in terms of a constituency would benefit from such a program. So what do you think of that? Well, first of all, let's just take a moment and, and think about it. In Los Angeles and in New York, they have more people than we do, less police officers than we do, and less crime. So let's not let ourselves think that police mean that we're safe. We need people to be empowered, to have a voice in decision making, and help them to improve their own neighborhoods. And as mayor, I am committed to community organizing. I'm committed to empowering people. Because when you talk about the crime that's happening in your own neighborhood, you're likely talking about your own children or your neighbor's children. We need to take, take new st a new stand, a brand new stand, a bold new approach to bringing down crime. And that's why I support programs like Safe Passage. Safe Passage, and we can have a senior program like Safe Passage, which provides protection to, to populations who are in danger of being taken advantage of. That's what we need, and it's got to come out of the community, and the government should support it, they should fund it. Thank you. All right, crime and punishment. Are you satisfied with these answers? Are you guys satisfied with these answers? Are they talking straight? Do you understand? Is it straightforward, understandable? Okay, good. We're on our way. All right, now time for our next testimony. And please welcome Kutsia Sultana from the Muslim Women's Resource Center. Kutsia. Good evening. My name is Kutsia Sultana, and when I first arrived in Chicago from Pakistan, I was in desperate need of a job. I ran into another Pakistani woman on the street who heard my story and encouraged me to go to Muslim Women Resource Center, or MWRC. When I came to Muslim Women Resource Center, they helped me to find a work program that helps me to get training as well as make a part-time salary through the state's Title V program. Without MWRC, I would still be at loss trying to find a job on my own. I work at MWRC through the Title V program, and every day I see so many people in our community coming to help to fill out various forms uh, for state and city programs. Many of them don't speak any English and do not even know that there is help available to them. Muslim Women Resource Center works hard to assist our community members who have access to services that we are entitled to. My question is, 
while the Asian American population in Illinois has increased by almost 50% in the last decade, finding for social services that are linguistically and culturally appropriate have not grown at the same rate. Will you commit to ensuring equitable growth in finding for such services? Ms. Sultana, thank you very much. Excellent. Miguel Del Valle. Well, the answer is yes. Of course, I'll commit. I'll commit to continuing to do what I've been doing for many, many decades through community organizing and through human services delivery in the state and at the city level. The city needs to lead. Lead in a way that it ensures that state funding and federal funding is appropriately utilized to fund resource centers in communities throughout the city of Chicago that are going to be linguistically and culturally competent services, which means that you have to have staff who speak the language and you have to have directors and administrators who are sensitive to the community and are able to understand exactly what the basic needs are and be able to deliver the services that are needed. We can do that. We should do that in every single neighborhood in the city of Chicago. But we should also unite those neighborhoods to make sure that everyone is working together to improve the city of Chicago. Thank you very much, Miguel. Uh, Carol Mosley Braun. The answer is absolutely yes. Again, include all, exclude none. And that comes to social services as well. There ought to be fairness in the, distribu in the distribution of social service support and money from the city of Chicago and for the money that the city receives and from the state and national government as well. And so I believe that, that we need to make certain that our social service dollars go where the need is and that it should be culturally and ethnically appropriate and fair and balanced. And so you have my commitment to work with you and to work with the organizations that put this forum on to make certain that, that there is fairness in the allocation of resources. Gary Chico. Uh, Pritzi, I, I agree with you that there should be equitable funding for all of our social service agencies throughout the city, especially those that provide those kinds of services that helped you at the Muslim Women's Center to find a job. I spoke with the gentleman who's the executive director of the Indo-American organization earlier, and what do we talk about? His worry about funding for his organization. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the reasons that the city of Chicago has got to straighten out its budget. We need to help organizations like the ones in this room do their job and help people because the city can't do it by itself. We need the help of organizations like yours. I also think we have to continue to fund our advisory groups for the city so that we get firsthand information about we are not, where we are not doing well and where we are falling short. And I intend to make sure that that funding remains strong as well. Thank you. Thank you. And Patricia Van Pelt Watkins. So, Chris, yeah, my, my answer is yes. But let me just take a step further. In the neighborhoods I work in, there are many people that live in the neighborhood that can tell you what services are not needed, which services are duplicated, which services mean nothing to the community. That's why I think it's important for the community to be empowered, uh, organized and empowered as you all have done here and begin to speak about what you need and where the money should go. It should never be the government coming in, dishing out $2 for this, $2 for that, when you may need $5 for this and $1 for that. When I developed housing on the west side of Chicago and the south side of Chicago, I developed 42 units of housing for families. Those families told us the kind of services they needed, and those are the kind of services we provided. If we are to have a, a neighborhood that works, it means the people are working together to bring the change that we need. And as mayor, I'm completely committed to it. I've worked with uh, many people in the Asian community, and I will continue to do the same in the future. Thank you. All right, I was probably going to bring this up a little bit later, but now is as good a time as any. First of all, linguistically and culturally appropriate services cost money. More cops cost money. Gary Chico, you talked about the budget, and you've talked about your ability to bring balanced budgets, 16, I think, of them, forward. Everybody knows this city is not going to be enjoying the sense of growth that we've had over essentially the last generation. All of you are talking about, yes, more services. Yes, and a chicken in every pot, so to speak. 
How are you going to pay for it? Are you going to raise taxes? Are you going to cut services if the real big issue here is the budget? Gary Chico. There's no doubt about it that we will not do business tomorrow the way we did yesterday. We will have to change the way we do business. For example, we've all talked about garbage collection. You cannot collect garbage anymore ward by ward with everybody having a ward office. It's just not going to work. We can't afford it. By changing the way we do business, I figure we can save three, four hundred million dollars conservatively. We are also going to have to raise revenue, Ravi, without raising taxes. There are ways to raise money in this city that don't go to taxes. For example, I've counted 14,000 lots that are in the hands of the city of Chicago that don't pay any taxes because they're owned by the city. I say we bring those lots back onto the tax rolls, give them to small business, just give it away and bring it back onto the tax rolls and provide tax revenue to the city and jobs. If you took half those lots and put them back on the tax roll, you might see $100 million just from that effort alone. So it's going to take hard work. It's not magic, but it can be done. But you need the experience to see how to do it. All right, let's let Carol Mosley Braun take a shot at this because uh, everybody wants to spend. It's harder to save. It's harder to cut. How would you get those kinds of services that she's talking about that are needed by so many people and police and everything else? How would you do that? Reform. Opening up government and having a, going at things in a more efficient way. I don't, I'm the only candidate, I believe, in this race who's committed to having no new taxes. No new taxes. And I believe if we just look at the budget, there are enough places where we can save money through efficiencies, doing business in a more business-like way, uh, and getting rid of some of the uh, uh, programs for rebates and subsidies that the city currently has that don't uh, make uh, uh, budgetary sense anymore. We can close this budget gap, one, by doing things better, being more efficiently, and then by growing our economy by growing our economy. We can't cut our way out of this budget deficit entirely. It's going to mean creating jobs in the neighborhoods, and that job creation will then generate the revenues that the city needs to do so that services such as we've discussed can be provided. I'm not prepared to throw in the towel on the American dream. I believe in the American dream, and I think our generation has every duty to make certain that we give the next generation at least as much as we received from the last one. It's up to us to make this budget work. Work. Thank you. Again, we're talking budgets. Everyone has to give you a minute on this. Patricia Van Pelt Watkins, go ahead. First of all, let me just say to hire 10 police officers, 10 new police officers for eight hours a day will cost you a million dollars, plus pension for the rest of their lives. So we need to think about when we talk about hiring a lot of new police officers, what that really costs. I think the better way for us to go about it, as I said earlier, is organizing communities, but also building new revenue sources. I want to establish a ladder program for new Americans to help them learn the basic English that they need to be able to get a job, and that will help small businesses. Also, I want to waive the, uh, all the fees for new entrepreneurs. There are entrepreneurs sitting out here in this audience that could, that could go forth and start a business and provide jobs. I want to waive your fees for two years and allow you to grow your businesses and establish your business. And after two years, if the business stick, then you owe the fees. But what will that do? That bring in new revenues, it will empower you, and we could bring new revenue in the city. They're expensive services, Miguel Del Valle. You know how important they are. How are well, you going to pay for them? Absolutely. And I was executive director of a human services agency, an agency that has been serving immigrant groups since the late 1800s. And I know that the city funding part of a budget is very small. A CDBG block grant and maybe a little bit here, a little bit there, most of the funding comes from the state and we get funding from the federal government. But now that there has been an increase in the state income tax, I think it is important that community agencies work with the city to secure as many state dollars for human services as possible. We can do better with the state, but the mayor of the city of Chicago has to provide leadership, and his staff and his department need to work with you, the agencies in the community, to secure those dollars and to make sure that we maximize the use of those dollars. There are more dollars available. We can get them. All right. Sounds like no new taxes from anybody. We'll see if you can square that circle, and I know we'll come back to the issues of budgets throughout the night.
It's time to go to our ne next testimony. Please welcome to the stage Mr. Mark Vong of the Vietnamese business community. Mark, go ahead. Hello, my name is Mark Vong, and I own a beauty salon here on Argyle Street. Like many small businesses, I do not make a margin of profit that allow me to fix major damage when they happen. I have water damage on my storefront window that cost $12,000 and did not know where I was going to get the money from. Through friends, I found out that there was a city program available where TIF money was being given to small businesses like mine to make such repair. I know that many of my colleagues here in the Argyle Business District do not even know this money is available to them. Some of them have taken advantage of the program once they find out through word of mouth just the way I did it is not good enough that we find out by word of mouth and are lucky that we were able to take advantage of a city service that should be fairly made accessible to all citizens. I notice a severe disparity when it comes to the city doing proper outreach to the Asian American business community. The economy of this great nation and city has long been driven by small business entrepreneurs. The Asian American community in Chicago has a long and, and distinguished history of driving local economies through small business development in community all over the city, in places like Albany Park, Chinatown, and West Ridge, to name a few. As mayor, how will you encourage small business incubation and growth through the tax code, community development funding, or other means? Thank you. All right, Mark, thank you very much. Let me just give you the order now so you know. First, we'll go to Carol Mosley Braun, then Gary Chico, then Patricia Van Pelt Watkins, and then Miguel Del Valle. Carol Mosley Braun. In the first instance, we ought to cut the red tape and roll out the red carpet for business owners who are creating jobs in the neighborhood. That needs to be the attitude from the top leadership to, to, to direct the activities of the agencies. The city of Chicago shouldn't be as hostile as it is to small business development and growth. I was just on Argyle recently, and a small business owner brought out a citation for $600 for a fine for something he didn't even know was wrong to do, and then couldn't get an answer back from city government about how he could fix this problem. So we need to have a liaison. We need to connect city government with small business as an advocate, as an ally, as a friend to support these efforts. As for the TIF funds, the TIF money needs to be audited. Nobody knows where that money has gone or where, what's, what they've done with it. Some of it's gone to the big companies downtown and not into the neighborhoods where it was supposed to go for development. And so in much the same way as other cities have done, I'd like to connect city government with small businesses in the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Gary Chico. Mark, your business is the future of the city of Chicago. Business in Chicago is small business. 80% of the business in this city is 20 employees or less. We need to pay more attention to you and what you're doing. I've called for a plan to really get behind small business in our city. Go to GaryChico.com. You'll see my plan for bringing small business back to our neighborhood strips. With regard to your question on TIF, I've also called for a city website called Sunshine Chicago to put all of the TIF dollars, and in fact, all of the programs that are available to you right on the web. Use an app on your iPhone, however you want to get to it. It should be readily available to you so that you know all resources available to you. And I'm going to have one individual responsible for dealing with small business. That's a new deputy mayor for business development and job creation. We should make Mark's life a lot easier than we have been. And we owe you, we owe you a debt of gratitude for what you're doing to keep our city strong. Patricia Van Pell Watkins. Mark, I, I, I like what you, said, what you said today, and, and in fact, it educated me about some things, the Asian American community, the number of jobs that you all bring. That's why I think it's important for us to, to get out of the business as usual at City Hall. As mayor, I am committed to no longer having this gotcha mentality. People all over the city tell me they feel like the city is out to get them. They're always trying to take something from them. We're going to change that because the people's voice would drive decision making 
in the Watkins administration. And that's why I talked to you about the ladder employment program. That's going to help small businesses when we're able to provide that education training uh, for new people coming, new Americans coming into this country to be able to get jobs in small businesses. Uh, making sure they have the necessary education language to be able to get those jobs. And also the new entrepreneurs program and streamlining the process so you can get the jobs done that you need to get done rather than be putting out a new sign, a new awning, or repairing something. Um, but I think that you all need to, as you all have organized here today, you need to continue to organize and that you need to have one voice that, that says what you must have and what you need in order to take your businesses forward. Miguel Del Valle. This, this year, there was an attempt to cut funding for chambers of commerce in our neighborhoods. We need to support all the business organizations and the different ethnic communities so that they could provide the technical assistance and the information that small businesses need on a day-to-day -day basis so that the communication is there and the understanding is there of what is available. But I think the thing that's hurting small businesses the most right now are property taxes. I talked to a business the other day, a restaurant and a grocery together. He is paying $26,000 a year in property taxes. I talked to a clothing store who's paying $10,000 a year. They're saying that they can't do it anymore. They're going to have to close. They're going to have to move. When that happens, we lose jobs. We have to deal with the tax situation. We need tax reform, and we need tax relief for property taxes. How many folks here just got their April 1st notice of what taxes they owe? That's it? N nobody else? How many people were astounded by the number? How many people really are going to have to scramble here to make that number when April 1st comes along? Do you think these folks get that? Do you think they get that? No, no they don't. Okay, so maybe we'll talk a little bit about property taxes because I'm glad you brought that up. A follow-up question. Everybody says for small business, red tape. Carol Mosley Braun, you said cut red tape. I think I heard red tape three times. Patricia Van Pelt Watkins as well. What specifically, Carol Mosley Braun, would you cut in terms of red tape that would help someone like Mark and everybody else to do a job and hire people? Hello? Uh, yeah. Go. Ravi, I don't know if you understand. I am a small business owner. I have a small business. I have a small organic beverage company. We're on 64th and Cottage Grove. And when I say red tape, if you go online to even apply for the basic business license, there are so many exceptions. You almost, I'm a lawyer. I graduated from the University of Chicago Law School. And as a University of Chicago trained lawyer, I had to go through trying to analyze what was involved and which category my own business fit under. In addition, you have the compliance issues and the reports. And like I mentioned, the guy who came up with a, with a citation for something he didn't understand. The rules are so complex, and there are so few people available, live bodies, who to answer your questions. That is the problem that small businesses face. And I just think that we need to make it easier for small business. Have someone you can go and talk to to answer a question about whether or not you're in compliance, what you need to do next. And I can tell you that when you get through filling out the forms, it becomes a cost of doing business that takes away from your profit margin and from your ability to... Okay, so compliance ref reports. Compliance, talking back to the city, saying I am doing the job. Does anybody on the panel here have a response to that? To the compliance reports being the big issue in red tape and that that is going to be what helps an entrepreneur like Mark do his job? No, that, that's just one of the things that needs to be done. And it was mentioned earlier that for a, a business to get a permit to put an awning or a sign, it takes months. And you have to go to your alderman and have the alderman introduce an ordinance. That is an archaic practice that needs to end. Each day that businesses wait to put up a sign or an awning means dollars that they do not get. And so we need to become a small business friendly city and we need to streamline the permitting process. And then the harassment of inspections that come in and day in and day out and citations that are issued, that has to end in the city of Chicago. Inspectors should be there to help you with your business, not to harass you and ticket you every day that they come in and establish fines that make it difficult for you to operate. How many people out here understand what a TIF is? Tax increment financing. How many people realize that it might be very important to you and to your business and to the economy and the area you live in? I'd like to ask the panel this. 
How are you going to improve the education to the city of Chicago around this notion of TIFFs? And how are you going to bring, as you say, Gary Chico, sunshine, transparency, and bring all this money, apparently, that is sitting there waiting to be spent probably at the uh, decision of an alderman? How are you going to make that more of a reality? Gary Chico, and then one more. The way you do it is use the power of the internet. Put all information about TIFFs out to the people. People are smart. They understand. What, what's not happening now is that the information that we do have is not made available to people. I was in Bronzeville recently, and I went on my laptop to try to find out the balance available in the Bronzeville TIF so I could see what was available to work with. It's not there. So once you make information available to people, like Mark, who might want to use his own energies to figure out what's available to him, he'll figure it out. He's a businessman. He knows how to get by. But it's up to the government to make all information available so that business people can know what's available to them. That's the major way you'll educate people. Patricia Van Pelt Watkinson, can someone give me a definition here of a TIF? Can someone explain what a TIF is? I'll let Patricia go and then go ahead. Well, I think it's important for us to understand that many of these, many, most, a lot of information is available to us on the internet, but we're not um, in a place um, techn technical, we're not technology, technologically prepared to address, to look at those issues. So I think it's important for the information to come down to the ground, that there's, you know, community organizations that have the information about what TIFs are in your area, what the money can be spent on. And I think it's important for us to come together and look at the money that's available in our areas, look at what's, uh, how it can be spent, make recommendations on how it could be better spent, and then, uh, Make, let the communities drive the reform. I think when we start letting communities drive the reform, putting the information in their hands through the community organizations, that's when we'll see the change that we need with the TIFFs in our areas. All right, Miguel, do you have a quick word on this, on TIFFs? No, I think you're running out of time. All right, well, okay, fair enough. If you don't want to take that. Well, go ahead. Yeah, you know what? This is really important. Give, give the folks a, a definition of this. 25 words or less. It stands for tax increment financing. And what tax increment finance is, is essentially where you freeze the property tax at one level, and then anything else that comes in, new taxes by virtue of the rise in the value in that particular area, then gets spun off to go back in for redevelopment. And the redevelopment was supposed to happen in blighted areas. And here's the big problem. They've been using it like it's a piggy bank. They use it for whatever they want. $15 million to the Chicago Board of Trade is hardly using those dollars for blighted areas. And so that's what we need to reform. We need to have a moratorium on the TIFs and then put it online and audit where the money has gone. All right. Sunshine. That's, that's sunshine. Okay. Quick show of hands. Who here is on the internet every day? Take a look, candidates. It's not, it's not 92%. The, 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 one of the, they haven't built an off-ramp from the information highway to a lot of the folks in this room. So how many people are prepared to go to one of these candidates' websites and look at their plan for small business, or look at their plan for TIF funding? There you have it. That's what we're dealing with. Okay, thank you very much. Government funding for Asian American-owned businesses decreased drastically while restrictions and fees increased. From 2004 to 2007, Chicago City Council excluded Asian Americans from its construction MBE, otherwise known as Minority Business Enterprise Program, despite the discrimination Asian American contractors face on a daily basis. Although Asian Americans are now back in the MBE program, Asian American groups have united to speak out about the need to remain in such programs. As mayor, how will you ensure Asian Americans are not discriminated against during the city hiring, appointment, and contracting process? Furthermore, how would you provide much needed relief for the Asian American business community? Gary Chico. Gary Chico, Patricia Van Pelt Watkins, Miguel Del Valle, Carol Mosley Braun. Gary? Brandon, thank you very much for your question. I think the answer to your question involves leadership. When the issue first surfaced that the city council was not going to include Asian Americans in the protected class to be given help under the MBE program, I fought for inclusion of that group. Why? I work alongside many people. I know that the, the disadvantage that you suffer, and it was wrong to even propose that the Asian American population not be included in that program. It has to be included in that program. In addition, we have to work in the city of Chicago to spend more money 
uh, with minority business firms so that firms have an opportunity to bid on these programs. Right now, I think we're not spending enough. We can do more, whether it's target markets, sheltered contracts, to let, to let these contracts open for Asian Americans to visit. I think we also have to look at our vendor relationships with communities overall. And that's, that's something that I'm very committed to doing because, frankly, the answer to our futures does not lie with the government. It lies with people like yourself, the people you represent, Mark's business, in doing well and providing for your families and making our communities strong. Ms. Watkins. Well, first of all, um, uh, Brendan, thank you for the question. Um, the fair representation of all communities has to be a priority in any, um, any uh, equitable administration. And as mayor of Chicago, I am committed to making sure that we all have access to opportunities and nobody is left out. In fact, I formed a group called United Congress of Community and Religious Organizations which is a multi-ethnic alliance uh, that works to ensure that everybody's voice is heard. It's, it's not going to work out well for us if only one ethnic group get everything they want when the other ethnic groups are not getting what they want. Because what's going to happen in the end is that there's going to be always a tug of war between us when we, we should be driving reform together. We all want one thing, and, and that is we want, a just, we want justice, we want freedom, we just want human rights, we want dignity. We want to be able to live in peace and be able to make something out of our lives. And as mayor, I'm committed to empowering all of our communities to see that that happens. Thank you. Mr. Del Valle. It's a very important question, and in the city of Chicago, of course, you know, we have a history, a history of pay to play. In order for you to get favorable consideration, you have to make campaign contributions, and a lot of people do that, and that's wrong. Asians should be a part of the process, and you shouldn't have to pay to play, which means that you need strong business organizations that are going to monitor the awarding of contracts and constantly be vigilant to make sure that not only is the total pot a fair amount for Asians, but that even within the subcategories, there's equity in terms of the distribution so that no one group gets left behind. But it is important that reform government. We reform government, and that's what I propose to do. I'm going to reform the city of Chicago so that we have honest government and that businesses, small businesses, are able to compete and not have to make campaign contributions in order to get contracts in the city of Chicago. Carol Mosley Braun. When I was ambassador to New Zealand and Samoa, I had a chance to see the great diversity in the Asian communities of the Pacific. Here in Chicago, you can see that diversity. Uh, all the neighborhoods have such great richness to us, and our diversity in this city is our strength. I have been a sponsor of the minority set-aside programs over the years, both at the state level and at the national level, and I have seen what's happened here in, the Chicago, in Chicago as a corruption of the intent of that program. The idea was to include all again and exclude none, and it's been just the opposite. We are spending so little uh, with minority communities in this city as to make the program a sham. I think that if we just make it a, a requirement for the contracting officers to unbundle the contracts, to judge their job performance on how well they do in distributing fairly the benefits of city contracts, we will go a long way to fixing this long-standing problem of an insider group trying to keep everything for themselves in the little cabal. All right, follow-up question time. Candidates, do Asian Americans require an affirmative action program? Specifically, not just the set-aside, but something that says these people have been discriminated against over time, and should they specifically, in legalese, be included in tough measures that allow for those kinds of contracts to be given in certain Let's just call them quotas. Ms. Miguel El Valle. As long as there is evidence of discrimination, and that is documented, then you have the right to be a part of affirmative action. We have to make sure that discrimination is wiped out in this country. We are becoming the majority. People of color are becoming the majority. And so the day is going to come when there will not be discrimination in this country against people of color because we will be in the majority and we want to make sure that there is fairness for all. And I said when I was elected, 
I'm, I'm a minority, but I have been a victim of discrimination. But when I become a legislative leader, I will not do unto others as was done unto me. That is the principle that I live by, and many of us live by the same principle. And so we will make sure that affirmative action is in place until we have proof that discrimination is no longer occurring. Gary Chico, do Asian Americans require affirmative action programs, or do we have the stereotype of the hardworking Asian American who's going to make his business or her business work no matter what? There's no doubt the Asian Americans are hardworking people. That's a given. But do you see enough elected Asian American officials? No. Do you see enough Asian American department heads? No. Do you see enough Asian American superintendents? No. I can go on and on and on, Ravi. The point of the matter is this wonderful community does not see itself in the reflection of city government in any city government or agency associated with city government. It takes work. And until we get there, where there is an equitable reflection of this community in the ranks of city government, yes, you must have that protection in law. And it, I'm very proud that when I had to pick a deputy chief of staff, I picked a Chinese American woman because she was the most talented person I could find and it was a wonderful representation of this community and she did a marvelous job for the citizens of Chicago. But yes, you need that protection until we arrive at where Miguel de Valle said we should be. You've taken my follow-up question. Let's move on. We're planning to try to get out of here by 8 o'clock and we will carry on. Now, let's welcome now Chris Nguyen from the Korean American Resource and Cultural Center. Chris? Good evening, candidates. My name is Chris Nguyen, and I'm a senior at Northside College Prep High School, as well as a member of the Korean American Resource and Cultural Center. Over the course of my volunteer work for the last two years, I have been granted the phenomenal opportunity to meet legislators to talk about immigration issues such as the DREAM Act and register people from the community to vote. And now for this mayoral election, I will be voting for the first time. Over the past four years of my Chicago public school experience, I have rarely learned about the achievements and works about Asian Americans. Not only have I not learned much about Asian Americans, I feel that many of our public schools are not equipped to handle and help Asian American students deal with challenges that are culturally and linguistically unique to our community. Our schools are not resourced to help Asian American students succeed. The popular stereotype of the Asian American community is of a group in which all members are highly educated with an extreme proficiency in math and science. The Chicago Public School data on the matter, however, paints a very different picture. In the last 10 years, over 20% 20 20 of Asian Americans drop out of high school before graduation. How do you propose reducing dropout rates, improving college readiness, and ensuring the elimination of funding disparities in the system that includes resources for Asian American students and families to succeed. Thank you. All right, the order, Patricia Van Pelt Watkins, Miguel Del Valle, Carol Mosley Braun, Gary Chico. Ms. Watkins? Well, number one, the redistricting process of 2001 has disempowered the Asian community in a number of different ways. And part of that is even in being sure that you have, even have a high school in Chinatown. That's something that should be a given, and it's not. So I think it's important for us to recognize something. Now, somebody said something earlier, and I wanted to get to the point, and that is that we're becoming a majority, and that we're not going to be discriminated against. But I did a lot of work in South Africa, and blacks are the majority, and they're still discriminated against. It doesn't matter how many people you have. What matters is that you combine your voices like you're doing tonight, and you begin to demand something from these legislators. Um, and let me just say on the point that, that Chris mentioned, um, I think that it's important for us to allow the youth to drive the reform in the schools. The youth can tell us, just like it's a program called Voice, Voices of Youth in Chicago Education. It's in 16 schools around this city. These kids are keeping kids in school. They should be supported. They're also pushing uh, to reduce the dropout rate and increase the time that teachers are spending with students learning. So I think that's what we need. Miguel Del Valle. This week, I announced that I, as mayor, will be establishing a re-enrollment program in our Chicago public schools. 
where we are going to get the 17 to 19 year olds who have dropped out of school and bring them back in and place them in an alternative setting or a setting that is appropriate for them so that they can complete their high school education. You're absolutely right. The dropout rate is increasing with some populations, but with other populations, it has decreased. And then in terms of college readiness, it is important that we partner with our city colleges to provide more dual credit and dual enrollment opportunities so that we can help our students obtain college credit while they're still in high school because college is very expensive. And we have to find a way of lowering the cost. And one of the ways to do it is through our community colleges. And then we've got to continue to fight for equitable funding in our public education system. The state of Illinois has yet to live up to its obligation for funding. Ms. Mosley Brown. I'm gonna pick up where Miguel left off. He's exactly right. The way we fund school education is backwards. It relies on the property tax. We don't get enough from the state and we get very little from the federal government. I worked as a senator to try to bring federal money in to help rebuild our crumbling schools so that we have environments that are suitable for learning. But I think the most important thing we need to do is to, is to um, uh, em empower communities and rebuild our neighborhood schools. We have been on a slippery slope to privatization of these schools and with the, with the smartest kids such as you being spun off into the special selective enrollment or the lotteries and with other children left behind in neighborhood schools that have gotten very little attention. I think that if we put the attention and the focus on the neighborhood schools, we will be able to put the resources in those schools that are appropriate for the neighborhoods in which they're located that will help attract the young people to paying attention to staying in school in the first place when we restore math, when we restore um, uh, music and art and physical education and the kinds of things that are attractive to keep young people in school. And then... Gary Chico. Well, first of all, I'm very proud of Chris and I'm very proud of the fact that you're an excellent student at Northside Prep, a school that I helped build. I'm very proud of you and the, the substantial Asian population that goes to that school, but you are right. The dropout problem is real and it is prevalent. Ladies and gentlemen, I propose we start with more preschools at the age of three so we keep students on the right path early, engaged early. We need more support services in the form of counselors who reflect again our population and are trained with sensitivity to the culture and language issues that you talk about. I was proud to have empowered our Department of Language and Culture so that our entire school system would have an appreciation for your culture. And I want to make sure, I agree with Miguel, I think we ought to have a program that even if we don't keep everybody and they drop out, we go back and get them. As a society, we're a compassionate society, and we never stop working until we get our children educated. It's the most important thing we can do. All right, we're under some time pressure. We'll move along to our next testimony, and that is going to be from June Couture from the Coalition for a Better Chinese American Community. June, please, go ahead. Good evening, everyone. My name is June Moy Couture, and I am the local school council chairperson from John C. Haynes Elementary School, located in the heart of Chinatown. As a parent of a 10-year-old fifth grader and elected representative by the parents of 700-plus students at Haynes, I have been strongly advocating for educational funding for our schools and much needed resources for our community. This includes a modernized library and a recreational center for our, for our students, who, by the way, are dismissed every day at 145. As efforts began, we found ourselves navigating through elected officials from four city wards, three state senate districts, four state representative districts, and three congressional districts. There are 50 aldermen in the city of Chicago, and not one is an Asian American. More importantly, Asian Americans have faced ongoing obstacles in electing the candidates of their choice and ongoing struggles in assess assessing city resources. This is partly because of the fragmentation of minority neighborhoods and the dilution of minority voting rights through redistricting. Asian Americans have joined together this election season and this redistricting cycle because we care about fair representation in our government, in our resources, in our political maps. My question is, will you commit to vetoing a map 
that continues to split Asian American, Asian American neighborhoods like Chinatown, Albany Park, and West Ridge into multiple wards? And how will you lead the way to pass ordinances that would improve the transparency and public input aspects of redistricting in the city of Chicago? Thank you. June, thank you, and our order will be Miguel Del Valle, Carol Mosley Braun, Gary Chico, Patricia Van Pelt Watkins. Miguel. Well, as some of you know, I have a lot of experience with redistricting. And from the very beginning, I advise individuals in the Asian community about the importance of being involved in the redistricting process. And it happened 10 years ago, and there was involvement, but you didn't get the results. This time, you're getting results. You've gotten results at the state level, and you're going to get results at the city level, because as mayor, I will veto any map that divides up the Asian communities and does not keep communities of interest together, because when it's done, it's done for the purpose of diluting your voting strength, and you are no longer going to tolerate that. And that is the message that needs to be sent, that we must make sure that there are public hearings, sufficient public hearings for you to be able to have significant input on whatever proposals on maps are put forth and that you ensure that maps that divide your voting strength are totally rejected by the mayor of the city of Chicago. First off, I'd like to let you know, I sponsored the first legislation creating the local school councils. And so I'm really delighted that you serve on one because they're important for our schools. The second is I filed a lawsuit, the first lawsuit on redistricting that sought to deprive minority communities of representation. And it created the district that Miguel Del Valle took. The first, he was a plaintiff, that's right. But I wrote the lawsuit at my desk. So, um, so I know what it is when they fracture or, 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 or compress districts to keep from creating uh, an opportunity for mi minority representation. I, ladies and gentlemen, I want to bring democracy to Chicago. I want to open up the process, open up the door so we exclude no one, we include everyone, and we give people a chance. At the end of the day, that's really what this is about. And I want to congratulate all of you for uh, holding this forum to talk about these issues. You have my word that I will absolutely stand with the Asian American community to see to it that you get fair representation in the next reapportionment. Thank you. Gary Chico. Ravi, I've always fought for the empowerment of communities. I believe it's the right thing to do. I will work with the Asian American community to see that there is a fair and open process, not one behind closed doors. And I'm telling you, you've got to be ready for this because the last three redistrictings are all done exactly behind closed doors, and people are not let into that process. There has to be public hearings with groups the size in this room to make sure that that system is kept honest. And when there's not these eyes on the process, that's when they carve you up into four pieces. So we have to be ever vigilant on this subject. And I will work. You have my pledge tonight because I told the Chinatown Chamber of Commerce three weeks ago I would do the same. I will work to see that this community gets, it, gets its just position in the city council. We can afford to do that. This is an important population to our city, and it needs to be represented at the table. And you have my pledge. I will work to you, with you to see that that's done. Patricia. I've dedicated my life to improving the lives of Chicago families. I've built coalitions across ethnic lines and religious lines and race and neighborhoods in order to improve our schools, to improve our criminal justice system, and to improve public safety. So as mayor, my commitment is the same. I'm running because I'm sick and tired of the corruption that runs this city. We pay the corruption tax through our businesses. We pay the corruption tax in our schools. We pay it in our homes. We pay it across the board. And it doesn't matter how many of us it is, when corruption is reigning, and what we need is someone at the top that recognizes corruption when they see it and brings it down and makes sure that the people's voice is amplified. And as mayor, I am committing to ensuring that there there is an Asian voice that is loud and clear and well represented in all of city government because that's where the power lies. The power lies within the people who are organized and have enough knowledge and enough commitment to push till they get the change they need. And you've proven that. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will take one, we'll do one follow up here on this because we do have a quick moment. 
and you brought up the issue of corruption. It's kind of permeated everything that we've talked about tonight. I would like each of the candidates to answer. If you become mayor, what is the one priority th policy, legislative effort, or uh, attempt to twist arms that you are going to use and dedicate your administration to to fight corruption in the city of Chicago? What's the one thing that these folks will understand that can be done, that should be done, that should have been done a long time ago, that's easy to do, that will fight corruption? Carol Mosley Braun. Well, to begin with, ending pay to play. And that's a major thing. Putting information online so people can say it, uh, can see what's going on with the, with the money in city government. Opening it up, making it more transparent, making government more transparent. You know, I've made it a point in all the years I've been in public life, I have never personally profited from my public service. I believe public service is a bond, is a commitment to the people to represent their interests. And unfortunately, we don't have that in Chicago now. And so I very much want to see a, 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 a new city council, a leadership in the city government that says this is the people's house, this is the people's business, and that is the commitment that we make not to private profit by anybody in city government. Gary Chico. Ravi, I would appoint the people in the government of the highest ethics and integrity. Secondly, what I would do is make sure that we have the strongest inspector general that we've ever had in the history of Chicago. And I've proposed just that by empowering the inspector general we have right now. Believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, we have two inspector generals right now. One for the city council and one for the rest of us. We need one. And that person has to have the power and the authority to chase down corruption and bad behavior wherever it is and take it, take it to its rightful cause. And then prosecute it, work alongside the uh, U.S. attorney and the state's attorney to get that kind of behavior out of government. Miguel? Well, there are a lot of things that need to be done in order to change the image. We have to start by taking money out of politics. We need to ban campaign contributions to aldermen and the mayor and the treasurer and the city clerk from individuals contracting with the city of Chicago. We need to ban campaign contributions from employees of the city of Chicago. We need to ban campaign contributions from individuals seeking zoning changes. The, you can't get any closer to a bribe than an individual who needs a zoning change and then they have to go to an alderman's fundraiser to make sure that they get help with that zoning change. That is wrong. We need to reform city government, and we have to start by taking the money out of the system that corrupts the system. Ms. Van Pell Watkins. Thank you. Listen, according to the University of Illinois, the cost of corruption in, in Chicago and Illinois is $500 million a year. We spend a half a billion dollars out of our pocket paying for corruption. So. I, I know that in order to defeat the corruption tax, we need ordinary people. We can't have the, the fox watching over the, the hen house. Uh, we have to get people that are within the hen house to watch over the hen house. So what I would do, the number one thing that I would do is I would promote a whistleblowers program so that people in government that know where people are stealing money from taxpayers, if they blow the whistle, they will get paid. They will get money for blowing the whistle and pointing out where people are stealing money from us in this city. And as, if people can get paid and protected when they tell the truth about where people are stealing money from, from us, you better believe a whole lot of people are going to come to the table and tell us the truth. And that's what we need now, the truth. All right, before we get to our final closing statements here, I have been asked to ask one question to get something on the record. I presume I know what the answer is going to be to this question. It's a yes or no answer to this simple question, and hopefully Channel 7 is rolling on this one because this might be some news here. Channel 7's in the house, by the way, the only news channel that's in the house tonight. <laughs> Give a shout out to Ben Bradley out in the back there, senior reporter, Ben Bradley, nice to see you. They're all glad that I'm up here and not you, by the way. The question is this, if elected mayor, Yes or no, will you commit to meeting with the Pan-Asian Voter Empowerment Campaign, the PAVE campaign, within your first 100 days in office? Within the first 100 days, will you, will you commit to meeting with this group? Uh, within the first 30 days. How about that? Miguel? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Of course. Thank you so much. 
It matters that we get these things on the record, doesn't it? I want to thank uh, our community members tonight. You did a great job for coming up and representing your groups, speaking about your issues, empowering these folks out here. The leadership of Tuet, thank you so much. Um, you've really thought about these questions, and I hope you think that the answers have been quite thoughtful. I certainly would suggest that they have been tonight. Now, time is short, so let's go to our closing uh, statements. One minute each. Here is the order. Uh, Gary, it will be Gary Chico, Carol Mosley Braun, Miguel Del Valle, and the final word to Patricia Van Pelt Watkins. Gary Chico, your final thoughts. Well, first of all, thank you very much to the Asian American Institute and you, Ravi, for hosting this debate. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I love the city of Chicago, but frankly, I think we've lost our momentum. You've heard through the questions of the very eloquent speakers tonight that there's a lot to do in this city. We need genuine change. I offer to you my experience of having been in municipal government for more than 20 years, serving as chief of staff to the mayor, chairman of our school board, chairman of our park board, and chairman of our city colleges as a way that we can go in that new direction. I don't want the city of Chicago rummaging through your pockets for any more money to fund waste and corruption in this city. I want to root it out. I want the city to live within its means, and I'm going to work hard side by side with you to bring about better schools in each and every neighborhood, safer streets that you've asked for, and Mark, I'm going to work with you to make sure that our small business community is respected and thrives. Thank you. I ask for your support, ladies and gentlemen. Gary Chico, everyone. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Carol Mosley Braun. Thank you very much, Ravi. Again, thank you for hosting this, uh, this forum and for the opportunity to visit with all of you tonight. You know, I'm reminded of an old song that said, I don't want anybody to give me nothing. Just open up the door. I'll get it myself. I think that that is, the ish, that is the message for all of us. If we can open up city government, we can make this a city that works for everyone, that excludes no one, includes everyone, and gives us real democracy here in Chicago. That is my commitment to you. I want to bring my skill set to bear from my work in local government as recorder of deeds, state government as assistant majority leader in the legislature, national government as the first woman uh, elected to the United States Senate from this, this state, uh, to the international realm when I was ambassador to New Zealand as a small business owner. I want to bring that skill set to bear on making government work for you, working, working for the people. That is my commitment. That is my record. And I ask for your support in this election. My punch number is three, and, and my email is, is Carol. Just Google it. Google it. <laughs> Miguel Del Valle. This is a turning point for the city of Chicago. This is an historical election. And this tonight is democracy in action. Democracy in our neighborhoods. The turning point that we face is, do we continue to put all our emphasis on downtown development? And do we continue to allow millionaires and billionaires to determine the agenda for the city of Chicago? Or do we finally begin to focus on our neighborhoods where the voters live and where the important people are who need to determine the direction of the city? Let's send a message in this election. The message is that the voters in the city of Chicago are going to determine who the next mayor will be, not the millionaires from Hollywood and Wall Street who want to influence policy in the city of Chicago in order to protect their interests and not the interests of the people, the majority who lives in the neighborhoods of the city of Chicago and who are going to make this city the world-class city that it should become. First of all, thank you, Ravi, and also thank you, Pave. You all are doing a fantastic job proud of you. I'm very proud of you because you are standing up and you're pushing for change and that's what we need in this city right now. The city has been ran by corporations for the last 20 years. They run our schools, they run our, our businesses, they run our neighborhoods. We have very little voice in anything that's, that's being done here in this city. So it's our time now. Not, let's not miss this moment. Let's take back the government and put it back in the hands of the taxpayers and then let the taxpayers drive the decisions that make this city what it is. We can take this city into a brand new place. We can send a message that will be heard not only in Chicago, but around the country and around the world that the taxpayers stood up together and united and they fought against corporate interests and demanded the change they have to have. 
I am Patricia Van Pelt Watkins, punch seven. Go to wwwpatricia Chicago and go, when you go to vote, punch seven. That's my number, and we can make the change we deserve. All right. There you have it, everyone. Thank you very much to our esteemed candidates. Thank you for bring, coming out tonight and thinking so much about these answers for a new generation of Americans who want to be a part of the process. Our thanks also to St. Augustine College. The president was in the house tonight. Thank you very much for hosting us. Remember, you can get out and vote early. PAVE will help you if you don't know where to go. But the election is February 22nd, and please ensure your voice is heard by voting. Thank you, everyone, for coming out, and good night.